Well, thank you for joining us for the extended Words Matter segment with Kel Richards. Kel, let's get into it. We've got some words and we've got some phrases. Now, one that Richard, a viewer, wants to know the origins of is the term spitting image. Oh, an interesting one. Very old. The original form of it was almost certainly S-P-I-T-T-E-N, spitten image. Now, we don't have the word spitten in the English language anymore, but a long time ago, a couple of centuries ago, it was the past participle of the verb to spit. So the idea is that this kid looks so much like his father, uh, he is the spitten image of him, as though his father had spat him out of his mouth. It's a fairly revolting thought, uh, but that's where it comes from. It, that's the idea behind it. And I remember the political puppets in the UK. That was the spitting image yes, uh, puppet, yes. uh, um, Margaret Thatcher and all the others. Very um, Dennis from Sandgate in Queensland, he wants to ask you about the proper pronunciation of camaraderie. Now, I've just doubted myself. I say camaraderie. <laughs> he doesn't like that. He likes camaraderie. You tell us the truth. I suspect I'm wrong here, but uh, what's your view? Well, I'm afraid, Peter. So you and I agree on most things, but there are five syllables in this word, not four. It's camaraderie. <laughs> so, sorry. Hey, can I say, it triggered a really interesting thought in my mind because having, having worked that out, uh, I then thought, hey, this answers a question for us. You know those really woke government forms that want us to fill in our preferred pronoun? What would happen if, when they say, uh -huh. what's your preferred pronoun, you said, comrade? I mean, that would really throw them. They wouldn't know what to do then. <laughs> well, Goff did it years ago. You remember, everyone was comrade. So we might, next time everyone they say, comrade. Are, are you a he, she or it or they? Say, no, no, comrade. Address me as comrade. All right. Well, let's go to Jeff uh, in Brisbane. He's written in and says, uh, how do we stop people using the word alternate? rather than alternative. He says they really mean alternative, but they don't use that term. They use alternate, alternate or alternate. But uh, help us out, Kel. Look, Jeff, I don't think I can help you out. Uh, they're so close in meaning uh, that, that you, we really have got to give up on expecting people to get this exactly right. Alternate basically is used as an adjective, so it modifies noun phrases. And most commonly, uh, alternative is used as an adverb, so it modifies verb phrases. So it depends upon the part of speech. But we're not going to get the current generation of journalists to learn that. Jeff, uh, just shake your head and say, uh, we're not going to win this one. All right, some phrases. I always find phrases, the origin of phrases, fascinating. Um, barking up the wrong tree. Where's that one from? Oh, that's simply about the behaviour of dogs. So the dog thinks he's got the cat uh, a treed in a particular tree, but the cat is over there in the next paddock uh, laughing its head off. Uh, it's, it's simply to do with the, the idea that you're in the wrong place at the wrong time, barking up the wrong tree from the behaviour of dogs. So it's as simple as As simple as that, is, yes. Eh? Green with envy. Uh, the idea is green has always been associated with sickness. So that's why you can, you can be in, uh, if you're in the pink, it means you're healthy. So uh, if you are so envious that you're ill, you are green with envy. It's the idea of green being the, the colour of illness, the colour of sickness. That's, that's sort of how you got so envious, you're making yourself really off colour. Now, turning over in his grave or her grave? Um, I don't know where this comes from. I don't know. Can I just... I'm going to jot it down a note here, make it homework, ask me next week mm -hmm. on the podcast. So, uh, in the grave All next right. week, that, that will be on the podcast next week. Now, that, that, to me, I'm marking it down in my diary note because that is a red letter day. It's, it's so rare that we've given Cal homework, so I love that. We'll come back to you on that one. Um, my dad used to say this all the time, oh, it gets on my goat. What on earth does that mean? The weird thing about this is, uh, this is a lot of research has been done by Michael Quinian, who's very good on these things, uh, and there were lots of theories about it. I'll, I'll tell you the wrong theory, then I'll tell you his story, which is, he says is the right story. The wrong theory is that it, it, racehorses are very temperamental, and to keep them settled, an animal was put to keep them company in their stall, often a goat, uh, and mm -hmm. if someone wanted to fix a race, they stole the, the racehorse, the goat, out of the racehorse's 
stool. That's the story, and it's really common and popular, but there is no evidence for it, none at all. It just sounds good. Uh, now, Michael Quinney has tracked it down. He said there was a very bad joke which appeared in newspapers in America in the 1800s and then was reprinted around the world. I mean, it's not a very funny joke. It's a man and his wife about to go out, and she says to him, would you go upstairs and get my goats for me, dear? And he says, goats, goats. And she said, well, they used to be kid gloves, but they're now so old and worn, I call them my goats. Uh, <laughs> and, and the next day, he went out and bought a new gloves. Okay? That's the joke, right? It's not a brilliant joke. But apparently, it, it was really popular in the 1880s, 1890s, was printed in Australian newspapers, British American newspapers. And from that, her instruction to go and get my goat is where the expression, get my goat, comes from. Now, Michael Quinney is, is convinced ah. that's the source, and he's so smart on these things, I think he's probably right. I like the one about the racehorses and the companion animals because <laughs> yes. I have heard that before. Not necessarily goats. There's lots of things that horses form an affection for and you want to keep a good racehorse at the temperament right on race day so I can see how that one works. This is an interesting one. One of our viewers said, in the nude. Why do we say in the nude, she says, when in fact when you're in the nude, you're not in anything? I, I, I presume it's because, I was looking at this one, I think it's, um, it, you could be in something, you could be in something which is not physical, so you could be in good health. So I think it's appropriate to say you're in a particular uh, or condition. Or in the mood. In the mood. As Glenn Miller would have said, in the mood. Uh, so uh, if you're in a particular condition, even though you are not in clothing, you're in that condition, you're in good health, you're in ill health, you're in the mood, you're in the nude. I think it's meant to be a condition rather than clothing. Ah, oh, Kel, there you go. Well, one bit of homework, about 15 that you knew off the top of your head. You're amazing. We'll catch up with you next week. Thank Talk you. Talk to you then. All right, if you want more, kelrichards, auswords.com.au and head to my Instagram page, Peter Credlin AO, to leave us words to do your homework for next week. See you then.